Good morning, everyone. You are very welcome to the How's It Going? A Survey on Wellbeing and Social Inclusion Report, Launch and Consultation. The panel will be delighted to receive any questions you may have. Please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your PC or laptop screen. If you're using an iPad, you will find this feature located at the top of your screen. As this event is supported with an ISL interpreter, we recommend for those online to follow the event in a gallery format. Please click view at the top of your screen to select your viewing preference. Without further ado, I will now hand you over to your host, Dr. Aideen Hartney, Director of the National Disability Authority. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And as that lovely announcement said, my name is Aideen Hartney, and I am the Director of the National Disability Authority. And I'm delighted to welcome you all here today to the launch of the How's It Going survey on well-being and social inclusion that we conducted last year. And it's really great to have so many people here with us today, both online and in the room. Uh, it's been a long time since there's been this many people in the room here in the NDA. So we're, we're delighted to have a full crowd again. Um, so, as I say, this is about launching the report on the How's It Going survey, which we designed last year, and it was delivered for us by Ipsos. And it was a survey that enabled us to hear directly from disabled people and others to learn about the difficulties that many people experience on a daily basis. And as you'll hear some more detail about the survey in a few moments, some of you won't be very surprised by the findings, but it is really sobering to learn just how many people report difficulties accessing public transport, GP surgeries and other surveys. And you may be aware that the National Disability Inclusion Strategy has recently come to the end of its term. And here in the NDA, we are looking at some data to extend, assess the extent to which the goals of that strategy have been achieved and the findings of this survey are going to be really important and a valuable addition to that assessment. We had hoped to have Minister O'Gorman here in person to launch the survey, but unfortunately he wasn't able to attend, but he has recorded a video with a message for us all. And before we listen to it, I'm just going to point out another couple of Zoom features for those who are attending online. So if you require captioning, you can turn this on at the bottom of your screen using the CC button. And the Irish Sign Language interpreter should be pinned to the screen, so you should be able to view them. And the chat function has been disabled, but as that earlier announcement said, if you have questions, we'd be delighted to receive them. Please post them through the Q&A function. And one of my colleagues, Cleana, is keeping an eye on that throughout, and hopefully we'll hear all those great questions later on. Just a reminder that the event is being recorded, so you'll be able to share it with your colleagues and friends at a later date. And also, we do have a photographer here in the room who's going to be taking a few shots of the event. So if you're feeling camera shy and would rather not have your picture taken, just be sure to let us know. After the event, we're going to email you a link to the recording so you can share it. So now over to the video from Minister O'Gorman. Good morning, everyone. Unfortunately, I can't attend the launch of the Wellbeing and Social Inclusion Survey report in person. I'm sending this virtual message to congratulate the NDA on their work and to commend the report. I launched this survey back in April, so it's great to see the fi findings now being published. This report illustrates how important it is to provide people with opportunities to tell us about how things are going for them. The survey found that too many disabled people, especially those who reported disability to a great extent, are finding life tough and face barriers and difficulties to participating fully in society. Many report that they do not feel part of their communities and have worryingly low levels of mental well-being. The report shows that the combination of certain characteristics, such as being disabled, single, facing a constant struggle to pay bills, and identifying as LGBTI+, can further reduce well-being. As Minister for Equality, data on these intersectional issues is particularly valuable to my department. 
The government is committed to improving well-being and social inclusion throughout Irish society. The government's well-being framework for Ireland is a cross-governmental initiative to help improve our understanding of quality of life and to measure how we are progressing overall as a country. This study, with, with its emphasis on disability, contributes to the knowledge base to inform policy development and particularly work that will take place over the course of this year to develop uh, an implementation strategy to direct Ireland's delivery of the vision of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. My department and I will work to ensure that the well-being of people with disabilities and all others that face marginalisation improves and that they can fully participate in our communities. To promote the well-being and social inclusion of disabled people, we need to consult with, listen to and learn from disabled people. The launch of the survey report will be followed today by a consultation hosted jointly by the NDA and my department. We hope that today's event will help us to identify measures that can promote social inclusion and will inform the development of the new and emerging policy. I hope that when uh, we next ask people how is it going, we'll be reporting better outcomes for disabled people and other marginalised groups. Thank you. So many thanks to Minister O'Gorman for his reflections on the report there. As he said, uh, this was launched back in April in the Botanic Gardens and he very kindly attended on quite a cold and blustery day. Um, so it's very nice to have his perspectives at the other end of the project. And it's very encouraging to hear his determination to improve social inclusion for disabled people and indeed all marginalised groups. So now for the meat of the event, I'm going to invite Dr. Caroline O'Nolan and Dr. Chloe Walsh, who are senior research officers here at the NDA, to present some of the survey findings. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm Caroline and myself and my colleague Chloe uh, work together throughout this project. And we are very pleased to be here this morning to present an overview of the findings. However, to get a more comprehensive picture of all of the survey findings, I do encourage you to download and to read the survey report, which is now available on the NDA website. So I'm going to start by explaining why we did the survey. So the main catalyst for this survey was the midterm review of the National Disability Inclusion Strategy, which pointed out the need to focus more on outcomes and capture the lived experience of people with disabilities. Initially, we planned to conduct a survey that was limited to adults with disabilities but we changed this approach based on input from our research advisory group, which included person with a disability, persons with disabilities. And we decided ultimately to open the survey to all adults living in Ireland. So this allowed us to expand our focus to other marginalized groups and also to compare outcomes with those that don't have a disability. Um, as was mentioned by Minister O'Gorman, promoting and advancing social inclusion is a key government objective. The survey data provides valuable information in respect of groups of people in Ireland that are not enjoying high levels of social inclusion. So our aims when we set out to do this survey were to assess both social inclusion and well-being of respondents and compare how it's going for different groups. It was also to assess the effect of the intersection of identity markers. So what that means basically is to find out if it makes a difference, if you have more than one characteristic that might make life harder. So we designed this survey as being largely an online survey. It was an opt-in survey, so people could choose whether or not they wanted to, to complete the survey. We provided it in several languages, including Irish Sign Language, uh, Polish and Romanian. And we also developed an easy to read version of the survey. So that was a modified version of the survey with uh, some of the questions 
uh, had to be excluded and there were some answer modifications as well. We also provided a paper version of the survey to specific groups uh, that to in order to address a di the digital divide. Uh, the paper version of the survey was an exact replica of the online survey. So the table on this slide shows that the, the total number of completed surveys was 2,052. And as you can see, the primary mode of completion was online. So there was more than 85% of the surveys were completed online. And then 178 easy to read respondents and just 106 paper versions. The composition of survey respondents doesn't mirror that of the general population. And as this table shows uh, the key differences between uh, our survey respondents and the uh, population. So groups that were overrepresented in our survey are women, people with high levels of education, adults aged 25 to 64, people that identify as white and disabled people. Uh, I would say that the, the top number, the top uh, categories there are fairly typical of online opt-in surveys, uh, but not uh, disabled people. In terms of underrepresentation of the survey, then we had men, people with low levels of education, adults aged 18 to 24, so younger adults, and then the older age group, 65 plus, ethnic minorities and non-disabled people. So this pie chart shows, uh, uh, analyzes respondents by disability status. So you can see that we've got three groups that are pretty similar in size. So about a third of our respondents uh, indicated that they didn't have any disability. 29% said they had a disability to a great extent, and 38% said they had a disability to some, but not a great extent. The survey data consistently shows that disability status affects outcomes. So we've just shown for on this slide an example of employment outcomes. And we've looked specifically at people aged 18 to 64, which is typically understood as working age. And we can see uh, from the bar chart on this slide that the variance in the proportion of different categories of respondents that were either employed or self-employed. So 90% pretty much of people, of respondents to this survey that uh, did not have a disability were in employment. This compares to 15% of respondents who indicate of our easy read respondents. Um, and when we look, when we compare the two groups of people with a disability, those that indicated they had a disability to a great extent have an employment rate that is half that of those that indicate they have a disability to some extent. In respect of social inclusion and participation, the survey results suggest that having a disability impacts social networks. Compared to non-disabled respondents, our disabled respondents indicate that they are less likely to feel close to six or more people and are more likely to indicate that they feel close to none or just one or two people. This participant's comment about their social network provides some in insight into why social networks may be small. I am autistic and find socializing very difficult. I avoid meeting people as much as I can, apart from my immediate family. And another participant commented, I feel so ashamed that I am unemployed and that I have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I don't feel like taking part in social and leisure activities. I'd rather hide at home. Respondents were asked to indicate levels of agreement with a statement, I feel I am part of my community. This bar chart illustrates that just 5%, so that's one in 20, of non-disabled respondents disagreed strongly with this statement. But when we compare this with those who do have a disability, we see that Almost a quarter, 23% of those with a disability to a great extent, disagreed strongly with that statement. 
and 11% of those with a disability to some but not a great extent disagreed strongly. So comments provided by respondents help us to understand why people with disabilities may not feel a part of their community. I require assistance to take part in my community. And another respondent said, anxiety and depression play a part in feeling isolated from society and not feeling like you belong anywhere. Respondents were asked if they feel that there are things that make it difficult for them to participate in social activities. The bar chart on this slide clearly indicates that respondents with a disability, and especially those with a disability to a great extent, report difficulties participating in social activities much more commonly than those that are not disabled. So we see the percentages here for those with a disability to a great extent are 80% reporting that there are things that make it difficult for them to participate. And this compares to 34% for those who don't have a disability. Again, we have insights into their difficulties participating in society. No friends, no services for adults with disabilities. Once you reach 18, all the services stop. Intellectual disability makes it difficult for me. I have to be accompanied with one of my parents wherever I go out. Employers are not interested in people like me. All they see is disability, not abilities. Other comments were access to Irish sign language and society's attitudes towards death, the deaf community. Blindness and people's attitudes to my participation. Barriers were also identified by members of other marginalized groups. So this comment is from a member of the LGBTQ plus community. I feel comfortable taking part in LGBT community activities, but not clubs or classes generally due to homophobic and transphobic experiences before, especially in sport. There are less LGBT classes or activities than I'd like, but I take the opportunities I can. And the barriers were also identified by members of the traveler community, as we see from this comment here. Being a member of the traveler community, not being accepted in leisure activities because of racism. So I'm now going to hand you over to Chloe to conclude the presentation. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so in addition to asking people about uh, social inclusion and participation, we also asked questions about their well-being. So in terms of financial well-being, we asked people, um, we determined this by asking people questions like how they found their ability was to keep, uh, to make loan repayments and pay household bills. And we found that people who reported a disability experienced poorer financial well-being than those who did not report a disability. We found that people with a disability to a great extent, uh, sorry, 23% of that group said that it was a constant struggle to pay household bills and meet loan repayments compared to just 6% of people with no disability. When asked if they, if they were satisfied with their standard of living, 29% of those with a disability disagreed. This compared to just 10% of people who did not report a disability. So we also asked about mental well-being, um, and we, we, assessed, we assessed this using an internationally validated scale. And this allowed us to determine the proportion of respondents who had high or low mental well-being and also those who are at risk of depression. So if we, if we look at this table, if you look at the no disability group at the end, we can see that 6% of this group had scores that were indicative or suggestive of probable clinical depression. So they were at risk of clinical depression. This compares to 30% of people who reported a disability to a great extent and 14% of those who reported a disability to some extent. And then if we look at the next line, we can see that 13% of the no disability group had scores that were indicative of possible mild depression. And this was compared to 24% of those with a disability to a great extent and 22% of those with a disability to some extent. 
So the differences between those groups reporting uh, being at risk of depression are of concern, especially when you look at the no disability group to either of the disability, those who reported disabilities, but even when you look at the people who reported a disability to some extent and a disability to a great extent. So using that scale, we were also able to classify or to see the people who had who were scoring the highest well-being scores and those who were scoring the lowest well-being scores. So 45% of people who reported a disability to a great extent had the lowest well-being scores. 28% of those with a disability to some extent had a low had the lowest well-being scores. And this compares to 14% of those with no disability. And then if we look at the high well-being scores, we can see that 15% of those who did not have a disability had the highest scores. This compares to just 5% of those with a disability to a great extent and 7% of those with a disability to some extent. So again, there is a marked difference between the people who did not report a disability and the people who did report a disability. Um, we can also compare the no disability group to a population sample in the UK. So we can see that the, the percentages reported by the no disability group were quite similar to our population sample in the UK. Or not our population sample, it was a different study. So we also found that the mental well-being of other groups um, was also below average. So in particular, people from the LGBTQ plus community, single people, people who constantly struggle to pay bills and people who are educated to a primary or secondary level only. Unfortunately, we were unable to report to present data for um, other marginalized groups such as travelers, Roma and other ethnic minorities because we didn't have enough responses to the survey to do that. Then we also found that the intersection of identities does have a negative or can have a negative impact on well-being. So in particular, having two of the following characteristics um, puts people at risk of, of poor mental well-being compared to just having one of these characteristics. So those are uh, having a disability, being a member of the LGBTQ plus community, being single, facing a constant struggle to pay bills or loans, and having a high, the highest level of education as second level. And we also asked about access to amenities and services. And again, we found that disabled respondents reported more difficulties accessing all amenities and services that we asked about compared to non-disabled respondents. 53% of those with a disability to a great extent found it difficult to access public transport compared to just 16% of those with no disability. And 43% of people who reported a disability to a great extent found that it was difficult to access GP and other primary care health services compared to 12% of non-disabled respondents. Okay, and then finally, um, and this slide is quite relevant to the consultations that will follow, we asked people to indicate um, interventions they felt might help improve social inclusion and well-being of people with disabilities. So the top or the most popular um, interventions that were supported attracted very similar levels of support. These were improving access to education and training for disadvantaged groups, improving access to employment for disadvantaged groups, campaigns to promote inclusion and discourage discrimination, increased funding for community amenities and supports. So in conclusion, the survey results indicate poor outcomes for respondents with disabilities, especially those who reported a disability to a great extent. Members of the LGBTQ plus community also report outcomes across a range of measures, and this was particularly true if they, were also, if they also were disabled. The results show that intersectionality can have a negative impact on well-being. Um, and as I said, unfortunately, we were unable to present data for other marginalized groups um, with this survey due to uh, not having enough responses. So to achieve improvements in well-being and social inclusion for people, for disabled people and other marginalized groups, we'll need a range of interventions and supports. Um, these data from this survey, along with the consultation that will follow, will help to inform the UNCRPD implementa implementation strategy that will be developed for Ireland this year. So this and study highlights the importance of reporting the lived experience of disabled people in future strategy monitor monitoring. So that just leads me to 
express our sincere thank you to all the people that responded to the survey, to our project advisory group, to Ipsos for their help in gathering the data, um, to the community groups who helped us to launch the survey back in April, and a special thanks to our guest speakers today, Tony, Catherine and Orla, who are going to share their experiences with us. Thank you very much. Now, thank you very much, Caroline and Chloe, for taking us through that. I think you'll all agree there's a lot of very interesting stuff there. Uh, so I can take this opportunity that you can download the full report from the NDA website today. And we've also a small number of printed copies here, uh, as well as some a small number of easy to read uh, versions of the report. And in, I believe in our Q&A box, we're going to drop in a link to the report so you can get straight online and start reading. But as Chloe said, we have some guest speakers here today, so I'm delighted to introduce them and thank them for agreeing to share their experiences of social inclusion and barriers to participation. And our first speaker is Catherine Cooper. Catherine receives supports from the Central Remedial Clinic, and she's prepared a video presentation, which she's going to introduce now. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, everybody. My name is Catherine Cooper, and I am here, delighted to be here today at the NDA. Um, I am from the CRC in Harrestown. I've done a video, and I hope you enjoy watching it. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. My name is Catherine Cooper and I am delighted to be able to speak to everyone here today at the NDA to help launch natural, National Survey on Wellbeing and Social Inclusion. I am from the Central Medical Clinic in Hartstown Day Centre in Dublin. I had a stroke 18 years ago and it changed my life. I didn't understand what having a disability was until it happened to me and all the barriers that people with disabilities face in trying to lead a normal life. I stopped working and had to go on disability alone. Access, accessing places and getting transport became an ongoing challenge. I could only walk short distance and often had to use a wheelchair going out. Not all places are accessible. I had to try overcome barriers in my life on a daily basis and I couldn't understand why individuals with disabilities still had to fight so much just to be treated the same as everyone else. I have managed to overcome so many of these barriers and I am now a passionate advocate for public speaking in helping others overcome these barriers. Thankfully, I had the support of the service with amazing staff with the CRC where I attended a centre out in Hartstown. They provided me with great opportunities to become an active citizen in my own life. It was great getting the opportunity to understand my rights throughout classes, education and advocacy groups. I was able to better understand them. I was given the opportunity for training areas like the Assisted Decision Making Capacity Act with NUI Galway and the WRAP recovery program around mental health. This helped increase my awareness and build my capacity in these areas. I had the opportunity to join my local advocacy group and link in with other groups and use as a platform to improve my competence and public speaking. I was always very active in my local advocacy group and I am also the chairperson of the Adult Service Council. This is made up of all different adult advocacy groups across the CRC, along with the CEO, senior management, and a member from the Board of Management. From this, I have gained in experience, confidence, 
and I am able to be the forefront of advocacy work within the organisation. In August, the CRC were invited to attend a protest organised by Access for All in Clontarf Dart Station. Their lifts are often out of order, meaning many wheelchair, wheelchair users cannot even access some train stations. I spoke at the protest about how individuals with disabilities are often left are often left having to fight for the equalities others take for granted from transport accessible bathrooms. I was invited by DFI to help record a video in advance of the International Eradication of Poverty Day on the 17th of October. The video highlights the extra cost of disability and the pressures of the cost of living crisis are putting on people with disabilities. On the actual day, on the 17th of October, I was invited by one of our local partners to come down as a guest speaker to one of our local community centres. I done a presentation on the financial difficulties people with disabilities and our other groups face every day. Through our advocacy groups and committees, we have identified our various, various campaigns within the centre that we want to support. On the 14th of October, CRC Hearthstown had hosting duties with our partners Irish Wheelchair Association and the Tink House Building Accessible Campaign. We are in dire need of change in Ireland where housing needs to be not just visible, but it must be livable for all. We had some fantastic speakers sharing their stories on the day with many self advocacy committees, partners, as well as local TDs and the Minister Roderick O'Gorman. I was invited to speak on behalf of our centre and it was a great experience for sharing in and making actions to lobby and petition for action for change. Make Way Day is a key campaign we support in Hartstown and across the CRC every year. Make Way Day is a public awareness event to highlight the needs of people with disabilities in the public spaces we all share. Over the past few years, we have done a lot of work with DFI on Make Way Day and raising awareness. On the 30th of September, RTE at Morning Ireland came to CRC Hartstown to interview myself and Pierce Richardson the co-ordinator of the campaign from DFI. We highlighted the obstacles such as cars and vans, making it dangerous and difficult for people to access public paths and use necessary ramps. In December last year, I was invited to be a guest speaker up in Donegal at the Share Learning event of advocacy for the CH one region. This was done with the HSE, DFI and Inclusion Ireland and it was a privilege to be asked to share my advocacy work with them. I'm sure some of these issues may also affect some people here. Hopefully by listening to me today some of you will be able to take some inspiration and overcome the barriers that you are facing with your own lives and take action to help impact positive changes for others. Thanks for listening to me today. Thank you very much, Catherine, for sharing that video with us. Um, really, uh, fascinating and um, very important to see all of those barriers, which, as you very rightly say, should not still exist. But congratulations to you and to all your colleagues and particularly on all your advocacy work. That was wonderful to see. So now I'm going to invite Orla Casey up, who is a student at the Together Academy, and she's going to tell us about her experiences working and learning in an inclusive and supported environment. Yeah. Hi, my name is Orla Casey. Hi, my name is Orla Casey. 
I'm a student at the Together Academy. The reason why I enjoy the Together Academy is we can be who we want to be. And we can make more opportunities to be to make new friendships that will last forever. We are a big family who supports everyone. Trace Coveney, our founder of Together Academy, had an idea to, to make a safe place for people who has Down syndrome to gain a job or employability. The Together Academy is a social training college. The students are allocated one day in the classroom to learn new modules, such as math and internet skills, and also can learn how to cook or bake healthy foods. Uh, we have one day training in the cafe. Therese Coveney and Kathy Smith helped us to open a cafe in Wanderers Rugby Club. And so we can use certain skills like internet skills and maths and our customer service skills as well. We can be front of house, working on the till, or be on the floor, like being a waitress or a waiter. And we can work in the, in the kitchen as well. And also we can help out to make the coffees as the barista. So we can make more, more big impact on the, on the more, more of a big impact on the, on the society with, because people will spread the word around together about the Together Academy, which will bring more awareness with pe for people with special needs. The Together Academy has helped me and others to improve our communication skills and our and our customers. We can talk about talk to our customers as well to improve our communication skills and to improve our vocabulary as well, like remembering about the complicated orders. And from our, from our customers, the Together Academy has helped us balance classwork and our cafe work as well by giving us the right support and also uh, also bringing out our walks for our mental well-being to clear our minds. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you and thank you for listening. And we actually are more able than disabled. So thank you so much, Orla. Uh, uh, speaking as a customer of the Together Academy, I've had the pleasure of eating in the cafe and it's absolutely fabulous. I would encourage uh, anybody that's in the area to give it a go. Um, so we we agreed that we would just ask you a couple of questions just to, to ask, learn a little bit more about your life, if that's OK. Uh, before I do, I just want to say what a great job. I know you were very nervous before this, but you did a fabulous job in, in delivering that speech. Um, okay, so I was just going to ask you, uh, Orla, if you feel that you are able to take part in as many social and sporting activities as you would like to. Yeah, we can, because um, we can do like um, different types of clubs, like drama clubs or dance clubs, and also different types of sports, like basketball or swimming. Fab. Uh, so you're working at the moment, Orla, in the in the Together Academy. If you were to look for other work, do you think that would be hard for you to find? Not really. If we have enough support to help me to gain a job or any type of employability, I can achieve my goals. Orla actually told me before the event that she she'd gone for an audition for a TV show as well. So she's um, she's very much uh, looking around and has uh, lots of big goals, I think. 
you also sound like you've got loads of friends Orla and really positive approach to life and you're enjoying your life do you have any advice for other people who might not be quite in the same good place that you're in yeah never give up and always um dream big and be who you are we are more able than disabled fabulous great message thank you Orla Well done, Orla. The uh, nerves didn't show at all. And thank you so much for telling us about your positive experiences at the Together Academy and really showing us how initiatives like this can really make a difference. So our next guest is coming to us from Zoom, uh, Tony Wilkinson from Cork. And Tony is the chairperson of the Cork Parkinson Association and is a certified patient advocate. And he's going to give us a little presentation today. Hi, good morning, everybody. And thank you very much to Catherine and Orla, two very good testimonials there. As said, I am the chair of Court Parkinson's Association, and I have been a trained advocate for three years now and use that position to really hold the people accountable because that's what we need to do. People in positions who are there to give us what we are required should be held accountable. And I am very much of that. Now, one of the things that as chair of an organization, I get to hear all the different aspects of the people suffering with disabilities, I Parkinson's in my case, and um, the left hand is just slightly tremor because it is the Parkinson's and not my nerves. That's my nerves, right? Um, so what we do really is we look at what our people are after and need. Now we have all of us with neurological conditions, hurdles and barriers, and they're placed in front of us. And I just don't understand why. I have a neurological condition and it's only going to go one way. Well, actually sort of like that. And that is something that I just cannot understand why people, in authority, don't understand that. I am not able to change the direction of my disability. It will only get worse. I can slow it by looking after myself, by exercising, keeping as much as I can, and doing what I can. Now, the important thing is, as the minister was saying earlier, when he said, how's it going? The most common question I get asked is, you're looking brilliant, you're looking fantastic. And it's because my disability is an invisible one. You know, they can't see in here. And that is the problem. People look at me and think, there's nothing wrong with him. But there is. And this is actually causing a lot of issues. Because for instance, if I go for a blue badge for my car, now you're seeing me like this, and I look like a normal person. But my ability to walk is terrible at times. And 25 meters, and I'm sitting down, leaning against the wall, a lamppost, whatever. That is just how it is. And yet, to get a blue badge, my goodness, trouble. Then there are the things, you know, you've got the blue badge, 
you have the car disability allowance. And that is our biggest struggle. We have people who cannot get from A to B, live out in the country, they need a car. Now they're not driving themselves, it's for their partner, their carer. But they need to go out and be living as a normal a life as possible, down to the shops, off to see the GP, and why not a day out somewhere? They are normal people, and we are entitled to have the same access to things like that as anybody else. But the problem is, you try and get that card disability allowance. I have a folder of 22 people just from the Cork area who have been turned down time and time again. And it is wrong on many levels because they look at it as a money and a cash exercise not looking at the person and saying the needs of that person are and the requirement is. That is hugely, hugely important. It is not a government cash exercise. We need mobility. And that's what the minister earlier on said, that he would help us get mobility. But it's not there, it, it isn't. And the other big thing is the stigma. You have a neurological condition when you walk, when you speak. Um, myself, on a bad day, I can be drooling. Now, does that mean I've got to hide in my house? No, I've as much right to be out as anybody else. And I say that to everybody. I'm not hiding, and I will not hide. If I'm walking funny, so what? And my dyspraxia aspect is just incredible. I can be walking down the street in Bandon, and my left arm will shoot up in the air. It just does it of its own accord, like this. And it's in some cases, it's brilliant because people on the other side of the road acknowledge me. Hi, they don't know me, but you know, that's one aspect of it. It's, um, I mean, it's amusing, but I will not stop and I will not hide away. And that's what we've got to get across to people. Having a stigma, don't be ashamed. Get out there, you have as much right. I'll give you an example. Yes, uh, Sunday, we had our annual party at the Springfield Hotel. Now, if we had been exclusive and not inclusive, we would have had about 35, 40 people turn up at the party. But we are inclusive. Everybody who is our member and has Parkinson's is out there. So 140 of us were having a great party. And that's the way it should be. I'm not excluding anybody because of the cost of things. And I tell you, I've had somebody say, you should be careful about the costs of something. Well, I'm sorry, I'll tell them where to go because 140 people quite rightly had a damn good time rather than 35 or 40. That's the way I look at it. We're inclusive in this society. Everybody should be there. And if someone cannot pay, I'm not going to stop them being at a party because that's not right. And just one final thing, because I can see that we're sort of getting close towards the end. I just want to say that whatever condition we have, neurological 
and everything, whether it be Parkinson's, MS, epilepsy, we should be allowed to get onto public transport. We should be allowed to go down and to have access to things. Libraries, swimming pools, gyms. Why would that be held back from us? And when I first came over here, I had a phone call from a person and she said, my husband has been sitting in his chair for 16 years. He doesn't do that anymore. He was sitting in his chair because he was ashamed of having Parkinson's and the way he looked. He comes out and about now, he meets his friends. We go out for coffee and stuff. That's right. Yep, and that's how it should be. So um, I've said my little bit. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, that was very powerful stuff. And I'm sure, as you can tell from the emoticons floating up the screen, it's it's resonated with a lot of people. Um, but particularly, I suppose, uh, that challenge about disabilities that aren't as visible uh, and particularly public attitudes. And that's an area of work that the NDA is particularly interested in. So if you keep an eye out later in the year, we'll have some interesting reports out on, on that. I'm now going to hand directly to Tara Smith from the Department of Children Edu um, equality, disability, integration and youth. And she's going to say a few words about the consultation event that's going to take place after our break. So over to you, Tara. Good afternoon, I think it is, everyone. Um, and thank so many of you for coming um, here today and for tuning in online. It's a very important survey report that's being launched uh, today, and I'd like to thank um, colleagues in the A for presenting so well today the data from that report, but also for engaging with you and others across the country who contributed your views and the time to give those views uh, to this report. As Minister O'Gorman said um, in his remarks in the in the video presentation earlier, it's incredibly important that the policy and strategies that are adopted in this country are evidence based, that there is data informing the decisions that we make. And in relation to strategies and policies that relate to the lives of people with disabilities, disabled people in Ireland, it's hugely important that that data and that evidence is coming from you, from disabled people and their lived and living experience in Ireland. This year, 2023, we'll see a huge programme of work being undertaken by the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth. As Aideen mentioned earlier, we are, meant, we are developing a, a new national disability strategy to succeed the National Disability Inclusion Strategy, which came to an end at the end of last year. There's also a commitment in the programme for government, which is to develop an implementation plan to coordinate Ireland's implementation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So throughout 2023, there will be a lot of activity and a lot of work in developing this new strategy, which will essentially signpost the way forward for the next few years in terms of what the government does to address and respond to the issues, challenges and barriers faced by disabled people in Ireland. Ultimately, a report like the one being launched today gives us a snapshot of how people are feeling right now. How is it going right now? And over time and through the development process for this new strategy and the implementation of that strategy going forward, we would hope that responses to a similar survey in five, seven, ten years time will be far more positive, that 
people with disabilities will be able to report that they can become involved in social activities in their communities in an inclusive way and in a way that they feel is inclusive and aligns with their goals and aspirations. And I think the, the testimony that Tony and Catherine and Orla gave is really important because data can sometimes be cold statistics. It's important to be able to measure things, but those numbers and the, the statistics in the report mean things in the lives of disabled people in Ireland right now. And it's important for the government to pay attention to those messages. So following um, the launch now and following a little break, I think here in person at least, um, the department is grateful to the NDA for organizing a, a consultation event where we can not only pay attention to the results of this survey, but ask the question, what next? Given the information that we have, the evidence that we have and the data that we have now in this survey, what should we do about that? And so we'll be having a consultation exercise for those of you who can stay and participate here in person and those of you who can stay and participate online. And all of the views that you advance in the consultation exercise this afternoon will be very important to us in shaping not only the development of the strategy, but also the way in which we engage with disabled people and properly and inclusively consult with people with disabilities over the coming uh, six to 12 months so that the ultimate strategy that we adopt or that government adopts means something to you and to your friends and families uh, with uh, family members with disabilities so that you can pick up the strategy when it is launched by government and recognize something in there that will make a difference in your lives. So I very much look forward to hearing your views in the consultation exercise this afternoon and going forward as we um, develop further details on the public consultation events to come over the coming months. But thank you all for coming today and for inviting me to say these few words. I hope that puts a bit of context on what we'll do this afternoon. Thank you very much, Tara. And indeed, it's uh, very encouraging to hear how committed you and your colleagues in the department are uh, to this next phase. Sorry, I'm making noise here. <laughs> we have just a few minutes now for questions and answers. Um, so if you're comfortable, I want to invite Orla and Catherine to join me at the top of the room again. And Tony is available online. If you're in the room and you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. And for those of you online, if you want to type your questions into the Q&A box, Cleona's keeping an eye on this and she'll read out your questions to the panelists. And we'll try and get through as many as possible in the few minutes we have available. Uh, so are there anyone, anyone who wants to start off? Hello. Oh, this question is for Caroline and Chloe. Um, I was just wondering in the survey or in the survey report, it mentions um, people who report having a disability to some extent and to a great extent. I'm just wondering what is the difference there? So, <laughs> yeah, we use the uh, questions around disability that are were used in census 2022. And for the first time, uh, uh, census 2022 asked questions about specific conditions and also about difficulties doing everyday tasks. So two different questions. But for the first time in census 2022, it allowed people to, if you like, grade the level of their uh, condition or the difficulty that they faced. So anybody that indicated that they had a great difficulty or uh, a great uh, a condition to a, to a great extent is included as a person with a disability uh, to a great extent, once they said they had had that in, in any respect. And then people who only, who, who always indicated that they had a difficulty to some extent or had a little difficulty uh, undertaking um, everyday activities. They are people who are designated as people with a, a disability to some, but not a great extent. We will see this um, as a feature of the reporting when census 2022 uh, 
publishes when the, uh, the CSO publishes uh, data around disability, which will be uh, later in uh, 2023. So this will be kind of a, a break in the series, a, a change in the reporting around disability. Hi. Um, there's a lot of questions coming in online and a lot of really positive comments, so I thought I'd like to, to give you them. So firstly, um, Porik says that he loves the name How's It Going? It's in plain English and it's just brilliant. Um, Geraldine has a fan, in, uh, or sorry, Catherine Cooper has a fan called Geraldine <laughs> who said she's delighted to hear from uh, Catherine and she's a great advocate for the Dublin 15 area. Um, and thanks, Tony, for presenting the difficulties faced by those with neurological conditions from Eamon. Um, a few questions in, in relation to asylum seekers, wondering did anything come up in the findings about asylum seekers with disabilities or any thoughts on that? Um, a general question about if the survey is going to be aligned to progress the sustain sustainable development goals. Um, Another question from Megan, is there any plans to try and fill the data gaps for other marginalized groups that uh, you weren't able to because of the low level responses, for example, travelers? Um, just see, just um, uh, Pippa says, reflecting on the quotation from the autistic person and the metric of how many close friends respondents report, I wonder how an autistic person self-selecting to mix with a smaller group is being interpreted and I wonder about the risk of judging neurodivergence people situation by a neurotypical metric so um it's this is not to say that self-selection isn't created by barriers in our society just to say that it's complicated Um, I think one of the first questions there was in relation to ethnic minorities and marginalized groups. Yeah. Um, so we did try and reach um, some additional groups. Um, but we were when we were hoping to get more um, responses, but it was quite difficult. I guess there could be language barriers. And we did consult with uh, some community groups in picking the languages that we could translate it to. So we were advised to translated to Romanian and Polish to try and reach um, some smaller groups. Um, but unfortunately, we still didn't end up with enough responses to actually uh, present that data separately. There just weren't enough. There was, there was just too few. Um, but I think we gained a lot of learning when we were trying to reach those groups. We've taken a lot away from this experience. And hopefully, if we were to do this again going forward, we'd have different strategies for trying to reach those groups. Perhaps, you know, um, providing those groups with paper versions of the survey earlier might have increased responses. Um, because I guess some people, you know, not all of those groups would have good access to internet. Um, and this was a primarily online survey. So that was one um, potential barrier, but it's definitely something that we've made note of. And it's why we highlighted it in the pre presentation because we, we do know that they are groups that are very much missing. Um, and particularly those groups who also have a disability as well. Um, so it's unfortunate we couldn't present the data here, but it's definitely something that we are keeping in mind and want to address in future. And I'd just like to comment about the, the, uh, the observation around neurotypical or neurodiversity and what's, what's right, if you like, for, for people that might be in that group. And it was a very apt observation really to say that for some people, uh, they are comfortable with smaller networks. That's what they want. They want. They don't necessarily want to uh, be a party animal, let's say, or, or uh, you know, that that that's exactly what suits them. But but many of the uh, the comments that we got that flagged autism, uh, it it did flag it as a difficulty for people in social situations. So um, that that they were finding it. Uh, causing them a great deal of anxiety around um, essentially just just everyday social interactions. So um, I completely accept that that for some people, smaller social networks are are com 
are very suitable uh, and that for others that not so suitable. Question in the room yeah, first. Thank you. Oh, is this working okay? Um, I just have a, another little question on the data. I was wondering whether you could talk about um, why you chose to kind of uh, have adult respondents for, for this survey uh, and didn't include children? Um, I suppose uh, part of it was to do with ethical approval, quite honestly. It's much easier to, to it's, it's not that easy to get ethical approval, first of all, but it's much easier to get it when your target population are adults. Um, so, so that was part of it. And I suppose if we were targeting children, I think we would have had to have different questions and um, just frame it very, very differently. So we didn't, you know, I don't think we could have designed this, you know, and have as um, wide ranging questions as we as we did uh, if we included children in in our target population. But it's a really good point. I think, you know, there is a need to do more research that uh, consults directly with children with disabilities. And, um, you know, we didn't do it this time, but hopefully we will in the future. Um, we just have time for one or two more then at the very most. Okay, um, there's a question in from Dennis and she said the rate of employment among the easy to read respondents was very low. I'd be interested in hearing the panelists comments on this. So yes, it is very low. Uh, and if you look at census 2016, for example, uh, the employment rate for people with intellectual disability is about the lowest of anybody with a specific um, impairment. I think it's around about 17% in, in terms of uh, the age group that we're looking at here today. So our findings were actually quite consistent with census 2016. Uh, in terms of why it's so low, I think um, that people with intellectual disability may feel as if they are excluded from any job opportunities if um, if the job if they the job application requires a specific level level of edu educational attainment that they just don't have because the educational attainment level of people with intellectual disabilities is on average lower than that in the in the general population so um you know, I think it's it's an issue that needs to be addressed. I was delighted that Together Academy agreed to come along today and show a very positive example of um, how people, in this case specifically with Down syndrome, are uh, engaging, are doing a fantastic job and are able to take on uh, roles, uh, a variety of roles in society. Thank you very much. And unfortunately, we don't have any more time for questions and answers. So uh, Orla and Catherine, you got away, and Tony, you got away lightly, um, but lots of positive comments coming in about presentations. So thank you very much. Okay, um, you, you can sit down, back down again. Thank you. And that concludes the report launch portion of today's event. Uh, so what I want to do is thank all our speakers for very insightful and thought provoking presentations. Um, uh, so thank you to Catherine, Orla and Tony for that. Um, now, for those of you who are joining the consultation that's taking place online, there's going to be a 10 minute break before the next session begins really important that you've been emailed a separate link for the consultation session. So there's no point staying in this meeting room. But what we've done is we've put the link into the Q&A uh, box for your convenience um, in case you've mislaid that email. And here in the NDA, the in-person consultations are going to begin at 1 p.m. after a short lunch break. So what I want to do is thank you all for attending. I think you'll agree they've been very interesting presentations and a very stimulating discussion. Uh, and there's lots of food for thought for us in the NDA. And we're working very closely with Tara in the department, but also her colleagues across the department uh, on the wider quality side of things um, to, to, to 
address um, or to highlight some of the challenges other groups are, are feeling. I particularly want to thank our panelists today, as I say, Catherine, Tony and Orla, but also my NDA colleagues, Chloe and Caroline, who did the lion's share of the work on this event, on this project. Um, but also then behind the scenes, we have Nicole and we had Heather uh, and Claire helping out with some of the logistics. So thanks to them all. Uh, and also thanks to Roz Tamming, who's our head of policy research and public affairs, who really oversaw uh, the, the work from start to finish. Uh, I want to thank our ISL interpreters. We had Lisa and Darren and our captioner, Michelle, and also the team from IMS who provided the technical support for this event. So if I've forgotten anyone, please do forgive me. Uh, but for now, we'll bring this part of the event to a close and thank you all. <laughs>